Welcome, Deirdre. Good to see you again. Welcome, welcome. I see an Erky in the in the in the Zoom call. Is this a is this a Shelly Erky Erky? That's yeah. That's my mom. <laughs> Hi, mom. Hi, Shelly's mom. How are you? All right, we are live. You are good. All right, welcome everyone. Those are just joining us. Uh, we've got a few more people coming in. We'll wait just a little bit. Uh, welcome to <laughs> National Educated uh, Educators United's uh, presentation of the Fossil Free California Town Hall. We'll be starting in a bit. Feel free if you like to uh, let us know who you are, put your name in the chat, tell us a little bit about yourself. We'll be starting in just a bit. Hey guys, do you want this recorded as well? When we do live stream, it will be there and I can download it as a recording, but I didn't know if you wanted me to record it as well. <laughs> uh, just when we start the presentation. Okay. Yeah. Welcome everyone, welcome. We'll be starting in just a moment. <laughs> welcome to National Educators United's presentation of the Fossil Free California Town Hall. Just waiting for a few more people to join us. We already have 23 participating. This is a great crowd. Hello, Jack, good to see you. <clears throat> All right, Rebecca, it's two after. Is this a good time to start or do you recommend waiting? Go ahead and go. All right, well, welcome everyone to National Educators United sponsorship of the Fossil Free California Town Hall. I'm Mark Norberg, I'm one of the organizers with NEU. Uh, before we begin the presentation, we have a few general housekeeping orders of business to take care of. Uh, first of all, uh, if you don't mind, uh, we'd like to say hello in the chat box. Please share your name if you'd like to, where you're from, and uh, whether you're an educator or an education ally, let us know your role or title. I'm just letting a few more people in here. <clears throat> a couple other uh, housekeeping orders of business. Please make sure you're muted. Check your mics now, turn those off. As you know, it really helps cut down on background noise. Also, please, we wanna encourage you, if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, go ahead and put those in the chat box and we'll make every effort during the presentation to answer those questions uh, or those comments, but have no fear after the presentation, there will be breakout rooms and a Q&A and also an open mic. So we'll make sure that we get to all those questions and comments if we can during the uh, presentation. Uh, something about, a little bit about National Educators United. Uh, we are a nationwide grassroots organization of local and state educators dedicated to progressive solutions. We are almost exactly one year old today. Happy birthday, NEU. And we're growing by leaps and bounds. Not only do we have individual state groups forming, and you can see on your screen some of the groups that we already have up and running, but we now have over 6,000 members on Facebook alone, as well as members on Instagram and Twitter. If you are interested in joining NEU, joining an NEU state group, or starting your own state group if you don't already have one, please let us know in the chat or through our Facebook page or let us know in person after today's presentation. We'd love to talk to you. And with that, I'd like to welcome our host for today's town hall, Diana Curiel. Diana, take it away. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming to our program, a tool for the climate crisis divestment from fossil fuels. Next slide. 
I'm Diana Curiel. I'm a volunteer with Fossil Free California, and I'll be your host today. I'm a retired science teacher and a member of the California Teachers Association and the National Education Association Retired Affiliate. Next slide. In today's forum, our five speakers will present information and a variety of perspectives on the climate crisis and fossil fuel divestment. This will be followed by small group discussions and breakout rooms, sharing and report outs, and a question and answer period. Next slide. We wanna thank our hosts today, National Educators United, our co-sponsors, our Fossil Free California, Schools for Climate Action, and Earth Guardians, San Francisco Bay Area. Next slide. One of our campaigns at Fossil Free California is to convince CalSTRS, the California State Teachers Retirement System, to divest our pensions from fossil fuels. We're currently planning for a California Teachers Association forum to bring this idea to the attention of more teachers in California. In tonight's NEU forum, we'll discuss how you might bring the idea of divestment to the attention of your own union or professional organization. We'll share some resources with you in a document which we'll be putting in the chat. Feel free to use our example resolutions, download them and revise them for your needs. Next slide. Our speakers today are Cynthia Kaufman, Fossil Free California volunteer, Sandy Emerson, our board president of FFCA, Rio Myers Dahlkamp from Earth Guardians Bay Area Crew, Devin Del Palacio, a member of the governing board of Tolson Union High School District in Arizona and co-founder of the National Children's Campaign and Park Guthrie, Schools for Climate Action. Next slide. Our first speaker is Cynthia Kaufman. Cynthia is a volunteer with Fossil Free California. She's a faculty member at De Anza College where she helped students pass a divestment resolution in 2013. She's the di director of the Vasconcelos Institute for Democracy and Action at De Anza. Cynthia will be speaking on the climate crisis and the connection to fossil fuel divestment. Next slide. All right. Cynthia, go ahead. Thank you so much, Diana. And uh, great to see everybody here. Um, so by now we're all aware of the severity of the impact of the climate crisis and the need for urgent action. The now chronic fires here in California are, are a sign that this is not a hypothetical problem off in the future, but it's with us right now. And sadly, much of it is already irreversible. But to avoid the most catastrophic climate effects, sea level rise, extreme weather events, loss of agricultural production, two thirds of the fossil fuel reserves that are known today have to not be burned. Fossil fuel extraction, refining and distribution disproportionately impact people of color. In California, 92% of people who live near fossil fuel extraction sites are people of color. Government policies have the power to break the grip of the fossil fuel industries on our future. Through collective advocacy, we can help pass laws at the state, local, and federal levels that redirect government subsidies and other monies away from fossil fuels and support the creation of new energy systems and jobs, protect vulnerable communities, and empower those communities to choose their futures. If we take enough action at the right speed, we can still avert the worst outcomes and keep the planet habitable for our species. And indeed, many of us believe that the world we're building in this transition can be more equitable and more livable for all of us if we attend to the issues of equity and a just transition in that process. As we've seen with the COVID-19 crisis, it is possible for human society to do huge things and work together to solve major crises if we actually put our minds to it. And so this is a, just a slide of, you know, sort of a kind of a possible car-free future. Uh, next slide, please. The scientific consensus tells us that we need to re reduce global greenhouse gas emissions to 45% below 2010 levels by 2030 and net zero by 2050. And net zero just means that if we're still emitting greenhouse gases, we're also doing things like planting trees and engaging in good agricultural practices to suck some of that carbon out of the air. And all of that needs to keep us to a 1.5 degree Celsius warming. Next slide, please. So there are many things that people are do, have done and are doing to speed the transition to that sustainable world we're all trying to get to. They're supporting green energy, they're increasing uh, public transportation, they're putting higher emission standards on everything, they're planting trees. 
All those things are crucial, but to get to where we need to get to in the time we need, which is only about 10 years, these changes need to be accelerated. And this is where divestment comes in. One of the biggest drags on the transition we're trying to make is the political power of the fossil fuel companies, which are still at this late date receiving government subsidies in the billions of dollars. And the fossil fuel companies use their political power to slow the transition. So the point of fossil fuel divestment is to take away the political power of the fossil fuel companies by isolating them. The largest fuel, fossil fuel companies have 2,795 gigatons of carbon that they count as assets, but they can't burn if we're going to say within 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. That means either they get their way and they burn their assets and their profitable companies for the coming years and the planet is un uninhabitable or the planet remains habitable and trillions of dollars worth of their assets will necessarily become worthless. So uh, next slide, please. So that's why we're trying to get uh, get our, our pension funds to divest, to, to, um, to isolate those companies, which are, the, are by far the biggest thing that's slowing down the transition. Um, oh, I meant to say that in that last slide. So now advance the next slide, please. Did you want one more advance? Yeah, one more advance. Yeah, I skipped an advance. So um, divestment has worked in the past. Nelson Mandela claimed that the movement to divest from companies doing business with the white racist government of South Africa was a crucial part of the movement for a democratic South Africa. And there's quite a bit of research that backs us that up. The divestment movement around tobacco and pri private prisons and South Africa all had huge impacts on shifting policy and stigmatizing a part of the economy that, that was engaged in something that was really problematic. Uh, next slide, please. At this point, there's over $14 trillion of assets that have been divested from fossil fuels. Um, the fossil fuel companies kind of amongst themselves talk about divestment as one of their biggest worries. Some of the outstanding, uh, next slide, please. Some of the outstanding examples of uh, divestment are the government of Norway, the University of California, and as of yesterday, the state of New York's pension fund, with for, which for a lot of us who have been paying attention, this is huge. And one little tiny thing I wanted to say about that was activists in New York, over 40 organizations worked for many years. They were about to pass a bill. And just before they passed the bill, the pension fund decided that it was a really smart thing to do to voluntarily divest from fossil fuels. So it really shows the, the kind of the power of that work we're doing. So Fossil Free California is working to get the California State Employers Pension Fund and the California State Teachers Retirement Fund, so that's CalPERS and CalSTRS, to divest from fossil fuels. They've already divested from tobacco and private prisons. Divestment is not a difficult thing for them to do. They're, and um, and if they did, it would really send a kind of a shock to the, um, the investment world that it's time for people to, to stop the money pipeline and stop the, the money that's enabling these companies. Um, and the other thing and that Sandy's about to now talk about is besides those sort of uh, kind of political and moral reasons why we want them to divest, they're also losing a ton of money. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Sandy. Thank you, Cynthia, for giving us that context that points to divestment as a powerful tool to respond to the climate crisis. Our next speaker is Sandy Emerson. Sandy is a retired software executive and author of technical trade books on database software and operating systems. She's currently the board president of Fossil Free California. Sandy will be speaking about financial reasons to divest from fossil fuels. Next slide. Go ahead, Sandy. Thanks, Diana. Fossil Free California has been running divestment campaigns for about five years targeting our state pension funds. Next slide. Last year, we were joined at CalSTRS by youth allies who made comments at investment committee meetings and staged protests, help advance our petitions. They really helped pump up the volume in the dialogue with CalSTRS. Next slide. State Treasurer Fiona Ma, who sits on the boards of both CalPERS and CalSTRS, endorsed divestment as a result of our youth allied actions. So we're grateful to the youth and we're grateful to Fiona Ma, a powerful ally. Next slide. The only arguments that the pension funds really listen to are financial arguments. 
They uh, are sensitive to issues of climate change, but their fiduciary duty requires that they seek investments that have the most returns and the least risk. So we are making financial arguments that show that divesting from fossil fuels is a smart thing to do. Next slide. The fossil fuel industry in investment terms consists of fossil fuel reserves and the supply chain. So it's the companies that are building up the huge quantities of reserves that are at risk of becoming stranded assets. It's important to note that renewable energy like solar and wind falls into a different sector. It falls into the technology sector. So if you divest from traditional energy, you could still invest in renewables. Next slide. It would be good to stay diversified in all the sectors as CalSTRS and CalPERS say they want to do and continue in investing in fossil fuels if they were a good investment, but they're not. For the last 10 years, their uh, value has been declining. Next slide. They are now only 2% of the S&P 500. In, 40 years ago, they were 30%. Uh, of the S&P 500 in 2010 or so, they were 16%, but now they're about 2%. Next slide. And every year since its inception in 2012, a fossil fuel free index has outperformed a fossil fuel index in the S&P 500. So divesting from fossil fuels is a smart thing to do. Next slide. CalSTRS at this point has $6 billion invested in fossil fuel producers, the source of those carbon reserves. And throughout the whole supply chain, it has about $17.5 billion in fossil fuels. So this could free up billions of dollars to invest in renewable energy if they divested from fossil fuels. Next slide. We did a study showing how much more money CalSTRS would have made if it had divested from fossil fuels 10 years ago, $5.5 billion. This would give you know, about $5,000 more to each retiree. And uh, it shows the value of divesting. We, we did a very scientific review of the performance of CalSTRS actual investments and if fossil fuels had been removed, they would have made more money. Next slide. The good news is that what we want, of course, rather than having fossil fuels value crash suddenly in the bursting of the carbon bubble is for a more orderly decline of fossil fuels and a, uh, a continued ascent of renewable energy. The latest predictions show that renewable energy will overtake fossil fuels for energy production uh, no later than 2050. Next slide. Chris Ailman, the CIO of CalSTRS, who is adamantly opposed to divestment, called us out the other day when he said, we get protests and public comments at every single meeting from fossil-free California. And it really comes down to the decision whether you think divestment is going to bring about social change. For us, divestment has to be an investment decision. And we say, yes, it's an investment decision. It's the smart thing to do. Next slide. And people from other faculty unions are agreeing with our position. Debbie Klein of Gavilan College, who's the president of the Faculty Association of California Community Colleges said, continuing to hold in a letter to CalSTRS, mind you, with a resolution, she said, continuing to hold investments in fossil fuel corporations is imprudent and inconsistent with the fiduciary duty of CalSTRS. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you so much, Sandy, for pointing out all the reasons why divestment is not only a necessary tool to respond to the climate crisis, but a financially prudent response also. Our next speaker is Rio Myers Dahlkamp. Rio is 14 years old and the co-founder of the Earth Guardians Bay Area Crew. 
He began requesting CalSTRS to put the topic of divestment on their meeting agendas when he was 12 years old. Additionally, Rio is exploring how to bridge his passion for climate justice into the world of marine permaculture. Rio will share what his experience has been like as a young person in the California State Teachers Retirement System boardroom. Hi, uh, hello everyone. As you heard, my name is Rio and I'm a freshman in high school. I've been focusing on golf stairs for a while now, which has been very frustrating. CalSTRS is a retirement fund for California public school teachers. CalSTRS has at least $6 billion invested in fossil fuels, but most teachers have no idea. And when they hear that, they're very shocked and are really upset. When our student groups learned about these investments, we had to attend every board meeting until I until they divest. In the beginning, we started out polite, providing public comment during their meetings. However, they have repeatedly dismissed us and tried to silence us. And they even made a new rule that said we couldn't be included in the public, ah, sorry, public record. We no longer can continue to sit silently and that let them shut us down so easily when there's so much on the line. We requested a meeting with the board chair to, di to discuss divesting from fossil fuels and for months they refused. But then we staged a disruption where my sister danced in the board meeting and fifth graders held up a sign that said, please meet with us. And it actually stopped the board meeting for a few hours. The board chair Chair and vice chair soon replied saying they would meet with us. The night before we got word that the CEO of Kelsters would also be joining us for the meeting. This proved they saw us as a threat and we saw that we were onto something. We want them to stop giving money to fossil fuel companies for many reasons. One main one being that it's devastating our planet and also that the investments are a huge part of environmental racism that affects frontline communities. As um, it's already been said, but in California, 92% of people living next to fossil fuel sites are people of color. And on top of everything else, the fund is losing money with these investments, also said before. Well, not all of you teachers are in, Cal are in California. Most pension funds have investments in fossil fuels. We need your help telling others teachers about these destructive investments and calling on your pension funds to divest from fossil fuels because we need that money to be reinvested in frontline in front solutions. My group, Earth Guardians Bay Area Crew, partners with Youth vs. Apocalypse, and one of their members named Isha made this message for California teachers, which I'd like to share with you now. Uh, can you pull up the video, please? Uh, it's not playing with sound. My name is Isha Clark. I am 17. I am born, raised, and educated in Oakland, California, and I am an activist with Youth versus Apocalypse. I have a special message for CTA leadership and members. Teachers, you fight for our futures every day, in schools, in classrooms. Thank you. The people who are in charge of your pension funds are actively destroying everything that you have worked to create for us. Please stand with us in our calls for CalSTRS to divest from fossil fuels. Next slide. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Rio, for your activism and your perspective. 
as part of the next generation of climate activist leaders. And thanks for sharing Isha's message uh, to teachers. It was very moving. Our next speaker is Devin Del Palacio. Devin is the Vice President of Community Relations and co-founder of the National Children's Campaign. He's a member of the governing board of the Tolson Union High School District, covering the cities of Tolson, Avondale, and Phoenix, Arizona. Tolson Union High School District's first African-American board member, Del Palacio has dedicated his board tenure to advancing equity. Del Palacio helped draft and pass a non-discrimination policy that includes protection for gender and identity and gender expression. He assisted the district in passing the Indigenous Peoples Day resolution, and he collaborated with board members to produce an anti-hate speech resolution, among other important board actions. He began working as a community organizer in 2012 and is currently the director of community outreach for Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Arizona. In 2019, Devin was recognized as the National School Board Member of the Year by the National Alliance of Black School Educators. Devin will be speaking about the impact of climate and racial justice on students. Thank you so much. Uh, it's truly an honor to be here with y'all. And before I jump into my remarks, I just wanna just give a huge thank you to everyone that has joined us tonight on a Wednesday night or whatever day it is because you know, the pandemic, it's a blurs day, but I wanna thank you. Um, and I wanna thank our educators on the call. And not only are you providing a space for us to lead on climate, but you're also obviously leading during this pandemic. And so I wanna thank you all for everything that you're doing for our youth and future generations. So I'd like to first begin by framing, by framing racial justice and climate justice, okay? And I'll first begin with racial justice. So racial justice is a systemic fair treatment of people of all races, resulting in equitable outcomes and outcomes for all, okay? Um, and uh, racial justice or racial equity goes beyond just being anti-racism or anti-racist. It is not just the absence of discrimination and inequities, but it's also the presence of deliberate systems and supports to achieve and sustain racial equity through proactive and preventative measures, okay? Now, climate justice, it's kind of a unique one defined because it's more than just a term, climate justice. Climate justice defines a movement, um, a movement that acknowledges that climate change can have deferring social, economic, public health, and other adverse impacts on underprivileged populations. Uh, and of course, a lot of us who are I, I think it's safe to say that anyone on this call is pretty much an activist in some way or shape or form. You are an activist uh, for, uh, for climate justice. And you know our, our strategy is to address these inequities head on through long-term grassroots efforts, okay? And as it's been said here by other speakers, um, it's no secret that uh, you know climate impacts uh, can exacerbate inequitable social conditions. So first, let's go ahead and talk about what that looks like for vulnerable populations, and then we'll jump into the effects on students. So for example, in communities of color, communities of color are often more at risk from air pollution. And this is according to both the NAACP, the American Lung Association, and other research papers. It's widely known. Seniors or people with disabilities and people with chronic illnesses may have a harder time living through periods of severe heat or being able to quickly and safely evacuate from major storms or fires. And if you're in California, you know about that all too well. Uh, people with limited income, okay, who may live in subsidized housing, such as I did growing up as a kid, uh, which too often times is located uh, in a floodplain. Uh, their housing options may also have inadequate insulation, uh, mold problems, uh, you know, or air conditioning to effectively combat, or no air conditioning to effectively combat severe heat and cope with strong storms. Uh, economically challenged people may also have, uh, may also be hard pressed rather to afford flood or fire insurance or rebuild their homes or, or pay for steep medical bills as a result of extreme catastrophic uh, weather events. Uh, not only that, but language barriers, and this is something that we don't talk about a lot. Language barriers can make it difficult, especially for immigrant communities to get early information about incoming storms or weather disasters or wildfires, et cetera. It could even be challenging for 
uh, due to those language barriers to effectively communicate with first responders in the midst of evacuation procedures. So um, we know the negative impacts. Now in terms of students, and I could tell you this as a school board member, I've been on the school board for six years and I have the honor of serving on the National School Board Association as well. A majority of schools are unprepared for extreme weather events, all right? I'm gonna say that again. A majority of schools are unprepared for extreme weather events, all right? Let's think about that. If we can't even pay teachers an adequate salary, an adequate salary what makes you think that we're also uh, you know, investing in, in infrastructure and buildings and systems, right? And in fact, it's the opposite. Many times due to politics and, you know, conservative legislatures, um, you know, we're, we're the victims of decades of underinvestment and disinvestment, uh, which has contributed to uh, outdated buildings, deteriorating infrastructure, putting a lot of our communities in immediate danger. And we don't talk about that enough. We don't talk about that enough. Um, not only that, but these effects also, you know, get passed down to parents. They get passed on to parents and cause parents to, to miss work during these extreme weather events, right? Which we already know put a financial strain on an already tight budget. So you combine that with a pandemic and it's catastrophic. It's catastrophic. Um, and we're seeing it play out, uh, unfortunately, right? We don't get to choose our disasters. They, they just happen. Uh, poor air quality, poor air quality. We know that, for example, asthma, right? Asthma is a common chronic disease. One in 12 children, school children, have asthma. And it's a leading cause that's disease related uh, for school absenteeism in our country. The leading cause, all right? 59%, 59% of, of absenteeism or chronic absenteeism is related to asthma. And if you look at the data, the disaggregated data, and you start to look at it and dig deep, a lot of this absenteeism, absenteeism exists in communities of color. It's no secret. And that's because they've been zoned into areas with poor air quality. All right. Um, and I'd like to reference this article written by the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, who, again, stated the obvious, and I know we all know this, but of course, children, especially infants, Toddlers and preschoolers are among the most vulnerable of these populations. They're among the most vulnerable. So it goes without saying that today's youth and future generations will certainly experience a more profound impact uh, of the climate change, of climate change effects as it worsens over time. I mean, we're talking anything from adverse health effects to financial implications. Uh, so again, just all the more reason why we need to take action immediately and we can only do that united through coalitions. And so who's do out there doing that work, right? Well, it's groups such as, right, um, you know, as your group, you know, NEU, it's, in, it's the NAACP, it's the Climate Justice Alliance, it's the National Children's Campaign, it's my friends over at the schools for climate action. They are actually building the momentum. They're building the momentum for climate justice action at all levels of government. It's leaders like Rio, right? It's leaders like Rio who are using their time and getting in front of these policymakers to advocate. We gotta be proud of our kids. We gotta be proud of our youth. Um, huge shout out to them uh, to certainly be at the head of this movement, which each generation that comes, we stand on the shoulders that were here before us. And so it's, it's a beautiful thing to see that the movement is continuing to grow and adapt and, uh, be, and, and be flexible in, in this great time of of need. So all that to say that racial justice and climate justice are not mutually exclusive. All right, they're not mutually exclusive. They're not. And I'll leave you with a, a brief quote um, from this Washington Post reporter. Her name is Sarah Kaplan. She wrote this. She said, you can't build a just and equitable society on a planet that's been destabilized by human activities, nor can you stop the world from warming without the experience and the expertise of those affected by it? Let me repeat that last part. Nor can you stop the world from warming without the experience and expertise of those most affected by it. So we know who, who's taking the brunt of this. 
It's the same people that are getting the brunt of this pandemic. It's not a secret. And so I say that because sometimes in doing the good work that we're doing, we might unintentionally leave folks out. We got to ensure this movement is inclusive. We got to sure we're bringing folks to the table. And we also have to understand that vulnerable communities, they're not looking or they're not in need of saviors, right? They're in need of allies and co-conspirators, okay? No saviors, they're in need of allies and co-conspirators. An ally is someone who gets it, who's out there, they're cheering it. A co-conspirator is actually someone who's picking up the mantle and doing some form of action to help move the needle. And so that's what we need, co-conspirators in this pursuit for racial justice and climate justice. Uh, with that, that concludes my remarks. Um, obviously, this is much a, this is obviously a much deeper and complex uh, topic, but this is the best we could do with, with four to five minutes. And again, I'm so thankful for having the opportunity to join y'all here tonight. And thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Devin. Uh, so much of what you said rang so true to me as a 30 year veteran in a teaching career. And um, yes, we have to um, really uh, make our grassroots effort work, working on racial equity at the same time as we work on climate justice. Thank you. Our final speaker is Park Guthrie. Park is a sixth grade teacher in Sonoma County, California. He and his students have experienced six climate-related disasters since 2017. Park has been a climate activist since 2014 and was a co-founder of Schools for Climate Action. Park will be speaking about student activism and divestment resolutions. Next slide. Thank you so much for participating in this important conversation. It is a privilege to speak with you. We as educators, as mandated reporters, can play an important role in helping to end American climate neglect. Divestment and climate action resolutions by educators unions send a powerful signal that helps revoke the social license of fossil fuel companies to continue putting young people and future generations at risk. The past three and a half years have given me a unique perspective on the climate crisis. Here is my class in May of 2017. As an intro activity for a climate change unit, I asked my students to place themselves between the numbers one and 10 to show how strongly they agreed with different statements. Most students agreed that it's important to learn about climate change. Next slide, please. But most students were not at all optimistic that we would solve this problem. Some were off the charts in the negative numbers. Please consider how the events of the following years that I'll show you shape the worldviews and spirits of my young students who were already pessimistic about their elders' ability to manage this crisis. Next slide, please. Five months later, the Tubbs fire devastated our county. This is Coffee Park, about 10 miles from our school district. All schools in Sonoma were closed for one to three weeks, weeks filled with sirens, choking smoke, ashes, uncertainty, general chaos. Everyone knows people who lost homes. It was traumatic. Next slide, please. The fall. <clears throat> Did you skip ahead? Yet yeah, the following year, smoke from the campfire shut down every school in Sonoma County for two days. Later, a climate-related atmospheric river caused flooding that did $130 million worth of damage, shut my school for two more days, and damaged my student, some of my students' homes. Next slide, please. Nine months later, it was fires again. My entire school district was in the mandatory evacuation zone. Next slide, please. Finally, like for us, like so many Californians, this fall was surreal and gut-wrenching. The Wallbridge fire was about seven miles from our school district and one third of my students had mandatory evacuations. A month later, it was the Glass Fire. Some of my students exhibit symptoms of chron chronic anxiety and PTSD related to these difficult three and a half years. We have known the potential harm for decades as elders, but as a society, we have simply chosen not to act to limit this harm and protect our children. This is neglect. And as with any dynamic of neglect, silence by witnesses is one of the key mechanisms that allows the ne neglect to persist. Since July of 2017, Schools for Climate Action has been working to break this silence from within the education sector. 
Next slide, please. Here are student climate advocates at the Santa Rosa School Board meeting on the left and at the California State Board of Education meeting on the right. Next slide, please. In March of 2019, 150 students and teachers delivered 50 climate action resolutions from school boards to every congressional office. Devin and I are in this picture somewhere. Next slide, please. Here's an advocacy team from a middle school in Washington, DC. Mandated reporters in the medical and mental health fields have been speaking up for climate justice as an entire sector for many years. By contrast, the habit of silent witnessing of climate neglect seems to be entrenched in some sectors of the education sector. The same week these young people were pleading for Congress to act, the National School Boards Association representing 90,000 school board members in the country considered a climate action resolution. Next slide, please. The resolution supported by Devin and the National Black Council was designed to warn Congress about harm to US kids in schools due to climate change. You can see in this screenshot that the edits proposed by the Florida delegation removed all mention of climate change. This edited version passed, protecting the psychological comfort and unscientific worldviews of a powerful minority in Congress, which organizes predatory climate delay. Next slide, please. So what do we do about it? Your participation tonight, your voices, and especially the collective voices of your unions are so important and powerful. Divestment and climate action resolutions are powerful ways to counteract silence about climate justice. Local union resolutions can trigger snowball effects that inspire others to speak up and to act. They bring us closer to social tipping points for a safe climate. So how do you pass a resolution? It can be very easy. Please go to this link on the Fossil Free California website. There you will find a climate action resolution toolkit with everything you need. If you're not in California or not in a CTA chapter, we have generic resolutions. We're also happy to advise you if you need help tailoring a resolution for your state or your site. Next slide, slide please. There are three or four steps to pass a resolution depending on your chapter bylaws. The first step is to simply read a sample resolution from the FFCA website. Next, find a colleague and an ally and have a conversation with your union site rep. Your, union, your site union rep will be the one to get the resolution on your chapter's executive committee agenda. Normally an issue must appear as a discussion item first on the agenda, and then it can come up for a vote at a subsequent meeting. Your site union rep may present the issue or he or she may request that you appear to present it. That may be all that, it, that is required, one, two, three, and you're done. Some unions may need to put the resolution to a vote before a delegate assembly. The entire process can take as little as two months and you can take the first step tonight. You can schedule step two this week. Next slide, please. Once you pass your resolution, it's time to leverage it. This is the most fun part. Transmit it far and wide. Be sure to share it with Fossil Free California, the CalSTRS board, and the board of the CTA. You can also share it with local student councils, PTA chapters, and neighboring educators unions, as well as local, regional, state, and national educators organizations, like associations of school psychologists, science teachers associations, et cetera. There are 25,000 education organizations across the country. If just 5% passed a divestment or climate justice resolution, it would trigger paradigm shifts that would bend our financial education and political systems towards climate justice. Thank you very much. Next slide. Next slide again. Thank you so much, Park, for your activism and your role in guiding the next generation of climate activists. For our next segment, we'll be going to breakout rooms for small group discussions. So um, each one of, most of the speakers will be hosting a breakout room. We'll have 15 minutes in the breakout rooms. Let's see, do we still have time for that? Yes. We'll have 15 minutes in the breakout rooms. Please introduce yourselves quickly and discuss two questions. Your uh, speaker slash host will record the notes and report out on uh, the two questions. First, 
Question A, what organization are you part of that might sponsor a divestment resolution? And what specific organization or target could you bring this resolution to? Question B, what concerns or questions do you have about divestment? And please rank your concerns or questions from the highest priority number one to lower priorities because we'll only have time to share out one. Uh, please be prepared to share uh, in one minute. And let's see, Mark is going to put us into rooms. Is that right, Mark? Yes, uh, Rebecca, are you still on with us? Uh, I'm not seeing the functionality uh, to create breakout rooms. Uh, let's see if we can get Rebecca on here. Uh, So what we can do while I'm uh, attempting to get the breakout functionality working, uh, go ahead and post any questions or comments in the chat box and Shelly will go ahead and direct those to our panel. And then our panel can just answer them uh, in this live open session. Uh, we may not be able to do uh, breakout rooms. Again, there's a technical issue here and I'll need to get Rebecca on. So go ahead and uh, is there anything you'd like to ask any of our panelists? They're still on or if you have any concerns, uh, want more information, or if you've had any ideas or thoughts that have come to you that you'd like to share, the chat is open. Just write question, comment, uh, and we'll uh, give you the floor. And people could also share um, if they have, if they wanted to share about the first question, which was what organization you might be part of that uh, could sponsor a divestment resolution and what organization would you target if you were to do that? So I actually have a question that came to me as Park was presenting. So as many of you know, or maybe you didn't hear, we're doing this presentation because this group uh, in January, we're going to present this to the California Teachers Association at our uh, quarterly meeting. So I have a question. Now, Park, do you recommend in Fossil Free California, do you recommend that I also take this to my local union, even though we're presenting this to our state union? What's your thought on that? Um. Yes, ab absolutely. Um, you know, it's really just, we're all social creatures. And so if we see the norm of people speaking up, calling for divestment, uh, it, it, all of a sudden it becomes normalized. And so with Schools for Climate Action, um, we definitely have seen the network effect happen just locally. We got one climate action resolution passed at a school board uh, and then the county board passed one and within, within like uh, four months, we had 13 other school boards pass these resolutions. So uh, if you pass a resolution at your local and share it with your friends, share it with neighboring locals, they'll get the idea to do it. Uh, and so that's really, it's really kind of simple. We're, we're just trying to make it the norm for people to send this very powerful signal. Um, so yeah, locals are great. That's that's how we're going to get it passed at this state eventually. Awesome, thank you. Shelly, do we have any questions you want to call out from the chat box? We yeah. do. There was a question for your students found any friendly ears in our state legislator, with legislature. Uh, you know, with Schools for Climate Action, we started uh, kind of trying to put pressure on Congress, but we actually just had a meeting. My, my uh, middle school students met with Senator Mike McGuire a month ago, and he's um, very energetic and very responsive to students. And my students asked him about getting more involved with CalSTRS divestment. Uh, and he, he said, um, you know, that that's a, a big task, but uh, he wasn't gonna say no to them at all. So he's, um, He's in email conversation with our eighth grade club president right now. Uh, so he, he's one person that, that um, is very proactive on climate issues. 
Uh, another question from the chat, um, and I'm not sure which panelist wants to tackle this one. What has been the barrier with divestment? Or maybe um, if you could talk about what some of the common barriers are or how we get around those, that would be great. I'll take Sandra. that one. Um, the CIOs of pension funds typically believe that they must stay invested in the whole market. And it's imperative that they own 98% of everything that's available to invest in. That said, they do have the ability to exclude losing investments. They just haven't availed themselves of that. They're just saying with sort of blinders on, they must re remain invested because the market is efficient. Unfortunately, fossil fuels are proving that false as they you know, practically fall out of the S&P 500. There was an article from Bloomberg New Energy Finance two days ago that said fossil fuels are divesting you uh, because they're becoming so worthless. And uh, this article said the smart money will go into renewable energy and avoid the risk associated with fossil fuels. There are risks financially, there are risks to people's health, there are risks to the survival of the planet. So. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Sandy. Great. Um, this question was for Rio. Um, Rio, what recommendations do you have for educators who want to partner with youth? Yeah, I saw that question. Um, so, Paula, do you wonder, sorry, were you saying that it was like partnering with youth that are working on Calsters or just youth in general? Oh, uh, you're muted. I was thinking, Rio, about just anybody, any educators who would like to bring youth on board, working on their own local divestment campaigns and other issues. What are the key things for them to be thinking about to be to be partnering with youth? Yeah, well, I'd say if they, if the youth aren't very um, educated on climate change and how this like divestment thing can help, I'd first start there and just sort of s explain like this is a massive thing. And then I'd say give them some power and say, I want you because like you're powerful and I want them to hear your voice because in reality, not many people have children talking in board meetings and all that. And so it really shakes up the status quo and does make change. So I'd say definitely give them some power, but not, yeah, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I would love to jump in on that one just because I actually got to partner with some of our students in Santa Monica um team marine so one of the good ways is to see if there are any clubs at your district's high schools or middle schools that are climate or environment related and get them involved in the resolution process our team marine got involved and they are the ones who presented to my union's um, representative council and got them to pass the resolution so it was really powerful hearing kids give this presentation. They got 10 minutes, 15 minutes for a presentation and 10 minutes to answer questions. And they got the resolution passed unanimously, um, which never happens in my local. <laughs> so um, it's really powerful to have the, to pair up with clubs that might already be existing in the schools. So just an idea. Um, looking to, I think somebody already answered the CFA question in the chat. Yeah, um, Frank and I are having a back channel conversation. Okay, <laughs> that's what I thought. Um, Mark just asked, are there toolkits for students to join Rio's group or other eco groups? Rio, do you know anything about that? Yeah, so my group, you can personally reach out to us, like if you're in the Bay Area, but and you can ask me in the chat about that but also if you're wanting to join earth guardians as a whole on their page um there you can sign up to become an earth guardian and then they'll give you a toolkit about how to 
um, make up your own group or or you could just reach out to a different group that's near you. And then, um, yeah, sorry, I missed the last part of that question. That was uh, all. Is there a uh, link or something? Do we have, do we have a link that we can put in the chat? Do you have, yeah. Do you have yeah. Rio, is it earthguardians.org? Yeah, that's it. Got it. I'm just putting it in the chat for you, everybody. And um, for those of you who may not have noticed, I've been dropping links in the chat. So if you scroll back up to um, links to different articles on divestment, we put some links in there, the uh, CTA resolution toolkit that can be tweaked. There are sample resolutions in there that can be tweaked for pretty much any situation. And then Diana put together a great resource document that links to a bunch of the things that we've been talking about. Um, Gabriella just put, would it be possible to include visual impacts specific to Southern California for a smoother transition for chapter locals in Southern California? Um, I know Southern California has been impacted by fires as well. Gabby, do you wanna to speak to that? I'm not 100% sure who you want to answer that or are you talking about tweaking the slideshow mm -hmm. presentation that we just did? Yes, because, you know, I think that that would then uh, get more buy-in from the Southern California local chapters when it impacts them specifically. And, you know, they can hear that message. I think that's the great impact of these uh, town halls is to build awareness and, and you know, how that, why they need to, you know, get involved in this, uh, in this cause, in this movement. Thank you. I think that's a great idea. I don't know what our mechanism is for doing that right now. Like to, uh, yeah, we can, yeah, Sandy, if we can do the slide deck. I don't know, Diana, if you're comfortable sharing this complete slide deck. I don't think that was in our resource list. But we can probably do that. Um, let's see, Bill, Bill Balderson, did you wanna go ahead and make a comment? Yes. Uh, let me. I'm on two different. Let me unmute, or am I unmuted? Oh. Um, um, I know a number of you, and uh, uh, we've been working on this for um, a dozen years or more. Um, we brought numerous motions. Uh, to uh, state council, uh, mainly through the uh, Peace and Justice Caucus. Uh, we've had a number of locals uh, that uh, are, have brought in motions already, including my own, OEA, UTLA, I believe the San Diego and, and others. Uh, and even through our Youth Activist Awards, which up till this year we gave annually, uh, we recognize, for example, youth versus apocalypse. Um, in fact, one of the speakers there challenged the CTA leadership directly upon receiving the award a couple of years ago. Uh, I won't go into all the difficulties we faced. Uh, it's not that people haven't heard about it or, or that there haven't been resolutions. Um, and even Harry Kiley, who's now Calster's chair, has come and spoken with us saying he wants to move this. Uh, I'll just mention one problem, not the only one, which is that uh, the retiree committee has been very obstructionist um, on this. Um, and what will happen is the CTA leadership will simply defer to them which is convenient and uh, say, well, we would like to move ahead, but it has to go through the retirees committee. <laughs> and, um, so I'm not saying it's impossible. And I think the, the work that's been done, especially in the last few years has really you know, brought the, uh, not just the visibility of it, it's been visible. It, it's uh, 
the power of young people coming to CalSTRS meetings, which I think has been uh, inspiring. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is that for those of us who are involved in the broader uh, labor and environmental justice movement, we have to talk more about uh, 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 divestment because you don't hear it in, in, in Labor Network for Sustainability very much or other groupings. Uh, our Labor Council has a climate caucus. Uh, my union has a climate caucus. We need to make divestment more front and center. I'll leave it at that. Could I just, just add something to what Bill just said? You know, I was working with the um, community college faculty to get, you know, FAC, which is an association of the community college faculty. And um, they did a tremendous amount of work internally in the organization. And then just like Bill was saying, it looked like it was gonna get killed by the retirement committee because the child retirement committee said, you know, and it wasn't even that they had any good arguments about it, but they just, you know, believed that they should sort of trust Calsters. And the leadership finally decided that they were just going to be bold and ignore the retirement committee. And the retirement committee people threatened to quit. And, you know, and the leadership stayed bold and it worked out fine. And the retirement committees kind of sat back down and nothing happened. So it was, um, I do think that CTA may end up with something like that. Does anybody else on the panel want to address that issue of how we uh, can mitigate that issue of, you know, when we're, you know, should we reach out proactively to the retired committee? What would be some, some solutions to kind of overcome that? I think that's a great point. I think some real grassroots work with that. Diana, do you remember when we were on the BATS call, there was somebody there who said he worked with the retirement committee. Do you remember that? So Mark, is there anybody in your activist network who's on that committee or who have, you know, who are close to that committee? Because I think they can be somewhat neutralized. They, they, engaging with them is super important. I'll defer to Shelly on that. Shelly's much more aware of, I think, the contacts that we have um, or if anybody wants to chip in, but we'll, we'll look at that uh, moving forward. And so maybe Diana, just note that as something we'll wanna, you know, reach out to and we'll, we'll find the contacts if we don't have them. The well, we know who's on the retirement committee. Yeah. So yeah, we'll definitely begin to start uh, uh, trying to contact and, and interact. Yeah. I also what? want to mention that we do have now a link in the, um, in the chat of an editable copy of the slide deck. So if people are interested in, in having a copy of that, uh, there it is, Sandy just put it in the slide deck. Cynthia, we do have for the um, CTA forum that we're gonna do in January mm -hmm. uh, during state council, we do on our California BATS, the ones who are sponsoring that forum, they, uh, we have at least two members that I know of that are on the retirement committee. Right. I think so, really speaking slowly and intensely with lots of listening with those folks is going to be so important. Yeah. Could I add one contact is a woman named uh, Gretchen Lippo, who yeah. uh, rep is one of the retiree representatives and has been on that committee for quite a while. And she's made good efforts. There are others, I agree, that, but she's I can get people her contact information. I do have a Dragretchen's contact information. Thank you, Bill. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, I did want to say we're going to be shutting off the uh, Facebook live feed in just a moment. We are here. I am here for the next half hour for anybody who wants to stay and continue chatting. But I just wanted to um, uh, note that as far as time wise, uh, we are turning that off. And uh, I'll just turn it back to uh, Diana. We're happy to continue discussing whatever you want to discuss. So yes, if anybody would like to put a question in the chat. Uh, and we do have the link for the editable copy of the slideshow. Uh, I swear I thought they said edible copy. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Sorry about that. I'll, I'll articulate oh, editable. <laughs> Editable copy is what I need in the morning. You turn up <laughs> the, the dial. <laughs> hmm. I am going to put the resource link again in the 
chat as well for everybody. It has a bunch of resources that Diana kind of collated for everybody. Uh, it's a hyperlinked doc. Uh, we have a new question, Shelly, coming in. Oh, there we go. Uh, how can we find a champion within the CalSTRS board or our state legislature or CTA statewide? Good questions. Anybody want to take that one? All I can say is we're trying, you know, I mean, we really have, we really have tried with the board having one on one meetings with people. Jane Vosberg, who's here, just banged her head against that wall for a good number of years. And we did get Fiona Ma, but it's hard because I think the board members, you know, most of you have experience with school boards where they mostly feel like they're supposed to just be rubber stamps and kind of defer to the, you know, staff. And I think that's what we're finding with the Calsters board is, and so that's been really, really hard. It's just been really hard. And, um, and then legislators, you know, we are starting to think about the possibility of, of a, a divisement resolution uh, uh, bill, you know, in the legislature, and uh, we don't have a champion yet. We have some people who are sympathetic, but we don't have like the person who's willing to do the extremely heavy lifting that it would take to, to make that happen. But um, but we're just starting to think about that. I have a follow up question to that issue. Is it public knowledge where each board member stands on the issue? Is that public? Is that publicly available? It's such an interesting question mark because they've all they've all been really wishy washy about it, you know, and and um, and something that would kind of force them to give their opinion or to vote on it or something like that would be very powerful. But um, they have not wanted to have to do that. So yeah. Can we force that issue? I mean, is that I don't I don't know the legal ramifications, but is it possible for Fossil Free California? to start publicizing, here's where everybody stands, either hard yes, you know, we have no idea they're being wishy-washy or hard no, and we just start publicizing that. And that gives the public an option to start reaching out individually to say, hey, I see you are not on board with this. I don't like that. Is that something that we could do? I don't know that they'd be willing to admit yeah. a personal opinion because I think that they have a lot of solidarity among, among the board and not kind of, uh, yeah, beyond what their public statement is. But when you listen to some of their public comments, some of them ask more questions than others do. Some of them um, like, well, some of them put it out that they have more concerns than others do and concerns both yeah. about investment and about the climate crisis. So you get some clues there. Guys, I, you put comment. Yeah. You, you yeah. Guys, yeah. Paul and Jane both have their hands up. Yeah, Jane yeah, and I. I everyone can see. Yeah. Uh, is there so, people than screen. So just type comments. So we can make oh, okay. sure we get everybody. Okay, I'll just, I'll Paul just. And Jane, but I want to make sure we get everybody. Yeah. So I've, I've been, as a volunteer, I've been researching some of their policy and protocols around this. And there is a very strong discouragement to that they have a policy that they are to speak as one on, a, as a board on this. And so they're under a, a tremendous pressure from within the organization not to express a personal opinion on this. So that's part of what's happening there. There's another question um, from Frank. Oh, somebody's answering in the chat. Is there